Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. You'll never guess who our special guest is today, best-selling author, Pulitzer winner, Jane Smiley. Thanks for being here, Jane. Oh, thank you. It's fun. You're one of our most accomplished novelists. Why did you decide to write 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel, a nonfiction book about novels? Well, actually, the original impulse was had to do with the attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001. I, um, I was writing a novel at the time. It was called Good Faith. And, of course, I was astounded by the attacks, just like everyone else. And I found that I couldn't, couldn't get back to my work, really. Mm -hmm. And I was also, you know, we look back and we forget kind of how shaken we were. But in, in some sense, we were more, I was more shaken even than I thought at the time. And so I decided I was going to read the farthest away novel that I could possibly get to. And it was The Tale of Genji, mm -hmm. which was written in Japan in, uh, in about 1002, maybe. And... Um, I read it, and it, it not only did take me away, because it was, it was from a very alien time, um, but it also brought me back, because it was the thematic material of the tale of Genji is, is Buddhist in origin, and it's a, lot of the, a lot of the novel is about how fleeting and ephemeral things are, um, and life is. And so there was a paradox there, because on the one hand, the blossoms were always falling, and, and the leaves were always turning, but on the other hand, Tale of Genji had hung around for a thousand years, you know. So how, what does that mean? You know, there's a paradox there about fleetingness and yet permanence. And that was an interesting thing to think about in, in relation to the attack, of course. And so I decided, well, this is so interesting. I'll go on and read some more of these early works. And so I read a couple of Icelandic sagas, and I read the Decameron, which... I had heard about as a book of erotic tales, but really it was much more interesting than that. It, it, the premise of the Decameron is that ten young people who live in Florence during the time of the Black Death leave Florence and go, go out and basically to the local spa and, um, and have a vacation from the horror of, of medieval or of plague-ridden Florence. And um, it, at the, that was when well, I was reading that at the same time that there was the anthrax scare, and of course we were thinking a lot about mm -hmm. biological terrorism and and plague and stuff like that. And yet, Boccaccio is so lively, and the stories are so funny, and they really are. Some of them are quite erotic, but it's really like it's really more about how people construct life, even in the in the presence of death. In a, to a degree that we can't even imagine. And um, so that was fascinating to me. So by the time I'd read five or six of those books, I said, you know, there's, there's something here that we need to talk about. There's something here that I need to write about, mm -hmm. about the, the continuing uh, importance or the continuing relevance of these old works. And my first plan was that I was going to read like 275 of them, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I, that was too many. I'm not a very fast reader. So I, I picked a round number of 100, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll read 100 novels, and some of them will be um, really famous, like Ulysses or Anna Karenina, and some of them will be really obscure, ones that I, at this point in 2002, don't even know the names of yet. And I did read quite a few obscure ones, and some of them were really fabulous, actually. And... Um, and then I thought, well, out of this 100 novels, I'll generate maybe some kind of sense of what the novel is, why it works, how it works, what it's cre how it's affected our own sensibility. And that, that turned out to be a lot of fun and quite interesting to me. Well, in fact, one of the first questions you <coughs> ask in the book is, what is a novel? Mm -hmm. How do you personally define what a novel is? Well, the, the rule that I say in the book is the novel is a lengthy written prose narrative with a protagonist um, and you'll notice that it doesn't say anything about whether it's true or not true uh, 
because um, the novel didn't really exist before you had, because it's prose, the novel didn't really exist before you could have a book. Um, because it's, and it's lengthy because there are all these other forms that aren't lengthy. And the novel is, is, was invented to talk about things that you couldn't talk about in a short form. And um, it has a protagonist because we want to know what happened to somebody. But because it's lengthy, the protagonist is developed on the one hand, and then the world that he lives in becomes developed on the other hand. If we think of a novel as something, a piece of narrative fiction longer than 125 pages, then you can see that the, the protagonist cannot exist in a vacuum. So the writer, as he's approaching 200 pages, 300 pages, 800 pages, however many pages, he begins developing this context for the protagonist mm -hmm. to live in relationship to. There's the cause, there's the things he does, there's the context of the world that he lives in, then there's back to more things that he does, there's back to more context. So eventually, every novel creates a kind of tapestry of a world. And sometimes the world is more, interested, more interesting than the protagonist. If you take a book like Tom Jones, which is a wonderful book by Henry Fielding, it's 900 and some pages long. Um, to us today, Tom himself isn't a very interesting character. He's kind of a open-hearted, you know, not very prudent, good-looking young man who's in love with his neighbor. <clears throat> but he's, he doesn't have any particular idiosyncrasies that make him interesting the way modern, some modern characters are. But the world that he lives in that's peopled by all these British eccentrics um, is fascinating. And the language that Fielding uses to discuss this world and, and how he wants to make it respectable and, make, and ponder it, that's fascinating too. So sometimes the protagonist sort of falls away and the world becomes more interesting, but it's still a great novel because we still want to read it, even mm -hmm. if the protagonist isn't that interesting. How has the novel as a form evolved over the years? Well, it hasn't, it hasn't. Because it, always ha because it has to have these five characteristics, um, it has to be written, it has to be prose, it has to be a narrative, it has to be lengthy, and it has to have a protagonist, which can be a male or a female. Um, that's a pretty tight box for something to be in. And one of the chapters of the book explores all the odd ways in which that box is sort of tight. But one of the, it has evolved in several ways. For example, in the early novels, um, the inner life of the characters isn't very well explored, and novels don't know quite know how to deal with that. Some do it better than others. Um, in some novels, they talk a lot. For example, in Don Quixote. Um, they converse a lot about issues, um, which means that the novelist gets to talk about the issues that he wants to talk about, but they're all, he, he doesn't go inside the character and explore his thinking about those issues. So the novel seems quite a bit like a drama, as it were. And evil characters, um, Novelists really didn't know how to deal with evil characters. They dealt with them in a theatrical way. But that meant they always had to be gesturing and swashbuckling and, you know, twirling their mustaches and stuff like that. Um, and it wasn't until about the mid-19th century, and I think with writers like Dickens, um, where novelists said, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make my evil character silent, but I'm going to go into his mind and I'm going to construct the logic of his thoughts. To me, a great example of this is uh, Dombey and Son, which has a, a villain named Mr. Karka, the manager. And he's constantly, he's a sort of smiling psychopath, and he's constantly plotting against his boss. And um, yet, on the surface, every, he, he seems charming and trustworthy. I mean, we see this type mm -hmm. all over the place. Um, so Dickens enters his mind and just shows us the logic of his plotting. And in doing so, he sort of opens up the whole field of villainy for subsequent novelists, you know. 
And, but that was a technique that took a while to develop. You know, people didn't understand it right away. Um, when, to me, one of the most fascinating things that I learned was I read a book that's quite obscure. Even, even a lot of French intellectuals that I know haven't heard of it called um, The Heptameron, which is a set of stories that was compiled by Marguerite of Navarre, who was the Queen of Navarre, in imitation of the Decameron. Decameron was 13, about 1350. The Heptameron was about 1560. And um, she, posed, uh, she posed a riddle to her group of, of friends. Can a woman um, know true love and retain her virtue at the same time? And in the 72 stories that we have of the Heptameron, they could not come up with a story that showed that a woman could do that. But 120 years later, uh, another French novelist named Madame de Lafayette um, wrote a book called The Princess of Clef, in which she solved the riddle. And she solved it technically. She solved it by having the princess, who lives at the French court, um, never express her love, but feel it. So she solved it by saying, oh yeah, I know what I can do. I can go inside her mind and go inside the mind of, the, of her husband. I can go inside the mind of her lover. And so in a sense, she invented the internal monologue not really a monologue, but it's kind of a, a way that the author has indirect discourse of going into the mind of the character as if uh, the character were thinking aloud. And once she did that, then in some sense, she transformed not only the inner life of her characters, but the inner life of the readers, because the reader was then encouraged to look within and to say, oh, you know, Things that I'm learning, I'm thinking about things. You know, I should pay attention to my own thoughts. So one of the effects of the novel as a popular form of literature over the years has been to give modern people a really strong sense of their inner life. You know, the average person in America um, is much more introspective, I would guess, than the average person in medieval France or the average person in medieval England. You know, and it's partly because we've been trained by novels. And in some ways, especially French novels, but, but all novels have adopted this way of, of the character saying, hmm, what, what should I do? What am I thinking? What's wrong with this picture? You know, how do I fit in here? How am I going to solve my moral dilemma? How am I going to sort my moral dilemma in relationship to the requirements of my society or my, my group. All novels are about that. And so as a reader who is entertained reads novel after novel, then she or you often it's a she, but she or he begins to say, hmm, what about me? Should I really marry this guy who, you know, looks great and has a good job, but really I like this other guy who is total, you know, who my family hates, I really like him better, you know. So I, I as a, just an average person, begin to take my own internal life much more seriously and to investigate it more. And in some sense, the, no, the novel has trained us to do that. You include two chapters for people who want to write novels. What's the single most important advice you can give to an aspiring writer? Just keep at it, you know. That if you're writing a novel, that you have to get to the end of the first draft. You cannot pause and scratch your head and say, "Oh, this is terrible. I'm going to go back to the beginning and and start over and fix it." You cannot do that because you'll get bogged down. You have to have that sense of energy that carries you from beginning to end. I always say, you, you know, when you begin your novel, you know enough be to begin it, but not enough to finish it. You don't know enough to finish it until you finish it. But if you expect that you'll know enough to finish it before you begin it, then in some sense you'll never begin it because you'll always be waiting to know enough to finish it. When you, when you finish, I always say the first, every first draft is perfect because it's finished. You know? And then, you know, however long it is, 900 pages, 400 pages, however long you manage to make it, um, you'll go back, you'll read it 
again, and it'll talk to you. Because you've read so many, you've read a thousand novels before you started to read, write this one. Mm. And those thousand novels are in your head in some way, and they will say, eh, there's something missing here. Maybe it's this, or eh, this is a little too much here. Cut that back. Um, so the main thing that you have to do if you're going to write a novel, and this is not, this doesn't apply to poets, it doesn't apply to to short story writers, it doesn't apply to essayists, it only applies to novelists. Just get it on the paper no matter what. Don't let the pe don't let that friend used to, friend of mine used to call it the committee. You know, don't let the committee tell you to stop. You know, don't let your second thoughts take over. Just keep writing and say, ah, I'll fix it in a second. I'll fix it in the next draft. Um, and that's the that's the thing to do. Can you go back? You can be a perfectionist if you're going to be a novelist. Can you go back and look at your novels with a reader's perspective? Or are they too close to you? Oh no, they're not close to me at all. Just the other day, I was about two weeks ago. I happened to reread a novel I wrote called *The All True Travels and Adventures of Liddy Newton*, which I wrote in a kind of time of upheaval in my own life, and mm -hmm. so I sort of wrote it with my reptilian brain or something. You know, I wrote it with my novelist brain that wasn't a really paying attention. And I went back and I read it. And I thought, wow, you know, this is <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> and even though I knew what happened, you know, and I remembered yeah. it fairly clearly, um, I liked it. And I read on. I couldn't stop reading. I thought, oh, this is exciting. This is exciting. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen, you know. Because I, I couldn't yeah. stop, you know. I was, re I was reading it as a reader rather than as a writer. You got the Pulitzer Prize for A Thousand Acres. What were some of the pivotal moments for you in the writing of the novel? Well, um, I don't remember writing the novel too much because it was a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. It was almost 20 years ago. But um, I do remember uh, one night in a hotel room somewhere. I must have been on a book tour uh, for a previous book. But I remember thinking about Ginny and really feeling sorry for her. Um, she's not her life is not based on mine. But I remember really empathizing with her life and sort of shedding tears about her, even though I hadn't written the whole novel about her. So that's one thing I remember. Um, I remember um, I, I followed the plot of King Lear very closely, and I just basically had the play in my hand. And I remember somewhere in the, about the third act or so, maybe the fourth act, I got off track and I stopped following the play as closely. And then I remember thinking, boy, I'm really messed up here. Uh, and I don't know what I'm doing. And I had to go back and and get oriented with, with regard to the play again and, and, um, and then keep going from there. So that was, a, that was an important moment for me because I... Mm. I thought I maybe I thought I had more leeway than I really had, but it also reminded me of how beautifully constructed the play is. The play isn't perfect, um, and Shakespeare owed a lot to um, er, his earlier sources, which he fiddled with too. And I, and I eventually decided that the material of King Lear, the play, and A Thousand Acres, the novel, is extremely old, probably you know, as old as mankind in some ways. Um, and it's quite intransigent material. It's hard to work with, and, um, and it, it tests your loyalties. It tests your, it tests your ability to comprehend what human life is all about. And I guess as I worked with the material, I, my respect for Shakespeare sort of grew because I thought, well, he had problems too. And um, and I'm having problems too. And that only and that old novelist idea. Well, I can fix this, which not all novelists have. <laughs> um, it didn't really work with the King Lear material. So I I felt a strong sense of um, connection with Shakespeare, which I'd never felt before. I'd always sort of um, seen him as a godlike or sort of uh, totally untouchable. Figure, but here we were wrestling with the same old material, and you know, I had this feeling of, of him patting me on the head and saying, "Yeah, it'll be okay." 
That's good. That's an important discovery. In fact, in 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel, you say, uh, know the, the novelist. In this case, you knew the playwright and probably helped learn who you were as a novelist in the process. Well, I did because the um, thing that had always bothered me about plays is that they, everybody's talking all the time. And of course, they have to be because they're on the stage, you know. But um, the thing I love about novels is that you can supposedly, the premise of the novel is that you can see within the character. They don't have to talk in order to, in order to have feelings. And so it was funny to me to realize that one of my problems with the theater is that they won't shut up. How did winning the Pulitzer impact your life, personally and professionally? Well, you know, personally it didn't impact it too much because I was four months pregnant and um, I was right at that stage of the pregnancy where you just don't want to know about it, you know. You want to <laughs> you want to sit at home eating guacamole and watching Oprah. You don't, you know. Um, but if, uh, but it, of course it was a big deal. But I didn't. Uh, I I later spoke to Michael Cunningham, who said that he embarked then upon a kind of triumphal tour around the world because people kept inviting him to come and do this and come and do that. And that wasn't an option for me because I was pregnant. So, in fact, it didn't, it didn't affect me too much at all. It was sort of more of a glancing blow than a body blow. Because mm -hmm. um, I was still working on a novel, and, you know, I had kids and a new one on the way. And so um, it was a little bit outside of my life. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as how it affected my work, well, I was halfway through my new novel, and, you know, so maybe the, the main thing I got from the Pulitzer was I got to go buy a horse. Which brings <laughs> us, brings us to, to your memoir, A Year at the Races, which has been called the National Velvet for Adults. Tell us about the role horses play in your life. Oh, they're a constant. I'm so interested in them. I, uh, they're they're idiosyncratic. They're, all, all of the horses that I have now at this point are ones that I bred except for well, I can't say that. The two, two I didn't breed, but I got them when they were young. So um, they're like my children in the sense that I, I cannot stop sort of observing and being interested in their personalities and their idiosyncrasies. And, and I now feel that every horse has as much of an individual life, inner life in a way, as as every person, or more, you know, horses, um, horses are mammals. Horses um, have mothers, you know, and they have a herd, and they have um, mates, and they have affections, and so they have emotional lives quite similar to ours. Um, their intellectual lives aren't similar at all, but their their willingness, their a willingness to have affections, their willingness to attach themselves, their willingness to um, give or not give, uh, their willingness to be included is, is uh, always a pleasure and a kind of astonishment to me. They're so generous. They're just as generous as they could be. You've actually said that every horse story is a love story. Well, it is, yeah. Because... Um, all, anyone who would write a horse story would only do it out of a love of a particular horse or of, of horses in general. So, but the, the love object is mysterious, you know. I feel it, uh, you know, when I'm riding, I feel it very specifically as a, as a form of movement, as a big body, as, a, as a, another consciousness that's there with my consciousness in a particular moment. Um, but on the other hand, He's not saying anything. <laughs> She's not saying anything. So I have to deduce a lot or infer a lot. There's both, both, both operations are present. I'm deducing from various movements and um, appearances that the horse is making. I'm deducing what he might be feeling. But I'm also inferring how to connect the various things mm -hmm. that the horse does. For example, I have a horse that ca came to me from the racetrack. It's not one of mine, and it's not one that I bred. And he came with quite a bad attitude. 
first time I ever laid eyes on him, he tried to bite me. Um, and we could tell, he was quite an expensive racehorse who had failed at the racetrack. And we could tell that he just didn't trust people, even though the barn he came from was quite, had a good reputation. So it was as if we, we all said, you know, he's, been, he's so used to being treated like an agricultural commodity that he doesn't realize that he's a being, you know. Whereas our horses, who had been raised by us and had constant relationships, always knew they were beings, always knew mm -hmm. that they were in relationship mm -hmm. to us. And um, so he has not been especially trustworthy. I've had him for almost two years. And he would be trustworthy sometimes, maybe progressively more so, but then every so often I'd feel his little teeth around me somewhere, <laughs> you know. And um, he had a little accident about six or eight weeks ago, and I, I had to take him out of the pasture and put him in a stall. And then because I have so many horses, I basically ignored him for about a month. Well, he was really happy to get back to work. He didn't like being ignored. And he's been a much nicer boy <laughs> since he came back to work. It's almost as if the wheels were turning and he said, you know, things could be worse. <laughs> and they are worse, and so I'm going to be a good boy now. Well, Jane, it's been a delight having you with oh, us today. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your new book, 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel. Good luck to you with oh, all your future you. writing. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.